Part Three of The Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part Three of The Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter Ten. The progress of invention in this country has been very remarkable," said Mr. Pedagog, as he turned his attention from a scientific weekly he had been reading to a towering pile of buckwheat cakes that Mary had just brought in. An Englishman has just discovered a means by which a ship in distress at sea can write for help on the clouds. Extraordinary," said Mr. Whitechoker. It might be more so," observed the idiot coaxing the platter full of cakes out of the schoolmaster's reach by a dexterous movement of his hand. And it will be more so some day. The time is coming when the moon itself will be used by some enterprising American to advertise his soap business. I haven't any doubt that the next fifty years will develop a stereopticon by means of which a picture of a certain brand of cigar may be projected through space until it seems to be held between the teeth of the man and the moon with a printed legend below it, stating that this is two for fivers, best rolled, from handmade tobacco, warranted not to crock or fade, and for sale by all tobacconists at eighteen for a dime. You would call that an advance in invention, eh? asked the schoolmaster. Why not? queried the idiot. Do you consider the invention which would enable man to debase nature to the level of an advertising medium an advance? I should not consider the use of the moon for the dissemination of good news a debasement. If the cigars were good, and I have no doubt that someone will yet invent a cheap cigar that is good, it would benefit the human race to be acquainted with the fact. I think sometimes that the advertisements in the newspapers and the periodicals of the day are of more value to the public than the reading matter, so called, that stands next to them. I don't see why you should sneer at advertising. I should never have known you, for instance, Mr. Pedagog, had it not been for Mrs. Pedagog's advertisement offering board and lodging to single gentlemen for a consideration. Nor would you have met Mrs. Smithers, now your estimable wife yourself, had it not been for that advertisement. Why, then, do you sneer at the ladder upon which you have, in a sense, climbed to your present happiness? You are ungrateful. How do you ramify? said Mr. Pedagog. I believe there is no subject in the world which you cannot connect in some way or another with every other subject in the world. A discussion of the merits of Shakespeare's sonnets could be turned by your dexterous tongue in five minutes into a quarrel over the comparative merits of cider and cod liver oil as beverages. With you, the chances are, the advocate of cod liver oil as a steady drink. Well, I must say, said the idiot with a smile, it has been my experience that cod liver oil is steadier than cider. The cod liver oils I have had the pleasure of absorbing have been evenly vile, while the ciders that I have drank have been a variety of goodness, badness, and indifferentness, which has brought me to the point where I never touch it. But to return to inventions, since you desire to limit our discussion to a single subject, I think it is about the most interesting field of speculation imaginable. There you are right said Mr. Pedagog approvingly. There is absolutely no limit to the possibilities involved. It is almost within the range of possibilities that some man may yet invent a buckwheat cake that will satisfy your abnormal craving for that delicacy which the present total output of this table seems unable to do. Here Mr. Pedagog turned to his wife and added, My dear, will you request the cook hereafter to prepare individual cakes for us? The idiot has so far monopolized all that have as yet appeared. It appears to me, said the idiot at this point, that you are the ramifier, Mr. Pedagog. Nevertheless, ramify as much as you please. I can follow you, at a safe distance, of course, in the discussion of anything from Edison to flapjacks. 
I think your suggestion regarding individual cakes is a good one. We might all have some separate griddles upon which Gladys the cook can prepare them, and on these griddles might be cast in bold relief the crest of each member of the household, so that every man's cake should, by an easy process in the making, come off the fire indelibly engraved with the evidence of its destiny. Mr. Pedagog's iron, for instance, might have upon it a school-book, rampant, or a large head in the same condition. Mr. Whitechoker's cake mark might be a pulpit, rampant, based upon a vestryman dormant. The doctor might have a lozengy shield with a suitable tincture, while my genial friend who occasionally imbibes could have a barry shield surmounted by a small effigy of Gambrinus. You appear to know something of heraldry, said the poet, with a look of surprise. I know something of everything, said the idiot complacently. It's a pity you don't know everything about something, sneered the doctor. I would suggest, said the schoolmaster dryly, that a little rampant jackass would make a good crest for your cakes. That's a very good idea, said the idiot. I do not know, but that a jackass rampant would be about as comprehensive of my virtues as anything I might select. The jackass is a combination of all the best qualities. He is determined. He minds his own business. He doesn't indulge in flippant conversation. He is useful, has no vices, never pretends to be anything but a jackass, and most respectfully declines to be ridden by Tom, Dick, and Harry. I accept the suggestion of Mr. Pedagog with thanks, but we are still ramifying. Let us get back to inventions. Now, I fully believe that the time is coming when some inventive genius will devise a method whereby intellect can be given to those who haven't any. I believe that the time is coming when the secrets of the universe will be yielded up to man by nature. And then? queried Mr. Brief. Then some man will try to improve on the secrets of the universe. He will try to invent an apparatus by means of which the rotation of the world may be made faster or slower according to his will. If he has but one day, for instance, in which to do a stated piece of work, and he needs two, he will put on some patent brake and slow the world up until the distance traveled in one hour shall be reduced one half so that the hour under the old system will be equivalent to two. Or if he is anticipating some joy, some diversion in the future, the same smart person will find a way to increase the speed of the earth so that the hours will be like minutes. Then he'll begin fooling with gravitation, and he will discover a new-fashioned lodestone which can be carried in one's hat to counteract the influence of the center of gravity when one falls out of a window or off a precipice. The result of which will be that the person who falls off one of these high places will drop down slowly, and not with the rapidity which at the present day is responsible for the dreadful outcome of accidents of that sort. Then, finally, you pretend to be able to penetrate to the finality, do you? asked the clergyman. Why not? It is as easy to imagine the finality as it is to go halfway there, returned the idiot. Finally, he will tackle some elementary principle of nature, and he'll blow the world to smithereens. There was silence at the table. This at least seemed to be a tenable theory. That man should have the temerity to take liberties with elementary principles was quite within reason, man being an animal of rare conceit, and that the result would bring about destruction was not at all at variance with probability. I believe it's happened once or twice already, said the idiot. Do you really? asked Mr. Pedagog with a show of interest. Upon what do you base this belief? Well, take Africa said the idiot. Take North America. What do we find? We find in the sands of the Sahara a great statue which we call the Sphinx, and about which we know nothing except that it is there and that it keeps its mouth shut. We find marvelous creations in engineering that today surpass anything that we can do. The Sphinx, when discovered, was covered by sand. 
Now I believe that at one time there were people much further advanced in science than ourselves who made these wonderful things, who knew how to do things that we don't even dream of doing. And I believe that they, like this creature I have predicted, got fooling with the center of gravity and that the world slipped its moorings for a period of time, during which time it tumbled topsy-turvy into space, and that banks and banks of sand and water and ice, thrown out of position, simply swept on and over the whole surface of the globe continuously until the earth got into the grip of the rest of the universe once more and started along in a new orbit. We know that where we are high and dry today, the ocean must have once rolled. We know that where the world is now all sunshine and flowers, great glaciers stood. What caused all this change? Nothing else, in my judgment, than the monkeying of man with the forces of nature. The poles changed, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit that, if the North Pole were ever found and could be thawed out, we should find embedded in that great sea of ice evidences of a former civilization, just as in the Saharan waste evidences of the same thing have been found. I know of a place out west that is literally strewn with oyster shells, and yet no man living has the slightest idea how they came there. It may have been the Massachusetts Bay of a prehistoric time, for all we know. It may have been an antediluvian Coney Island, for all the world knows. Who shall say that this little upset of mine found here an oyster bed, shook all the oysters out of their bed into space, and left their clothes high and dry in a locality which, but for those garments, would seem never to have known the oyster in his prime? Off in Westchester County, on the top of a high hill, lies a rock, and in the uppermost portion of that rock is a so-called pothole made by nothing else than the dropping of water of a brook and the swirling of pebbles therein. It is now beyond the reach of anything in the shape of water, save that which falls from the heavens. It is certain that this pothole was never made by a boy with a watering pot, by a hired man with a hose, by a workman with a drill, or by any rainstorm that ever fell in Westchester County. There must, at some time or another, have been a stream there. And, as streams do not flow uphill and bore potholes on mountain tops, there must have been a valley there. Some great cataclysm took place. For that cataclysm nature must be held responsible, mainly. But what prompted nature to raise Hob with Westchester County millions of years ago and let it sleep like Rip Van Winkle ever since? Nature isn't a freak. She is depicted as a woman, but in spite of that she is not whimsical. She does not act upon impulses. There must have been some cause for her behavior in turning valleys into hills, in transforming huge cities into wastes of sand and oyster beds into shell quarries, and it is my belief that man was the contributing cause. He tapped the earth for natural gas. He bored in, and he bored out, and he bored nature to death. And then nature rose up and smote him and his cities and his oyster beds, and she'll do it again unless we go slow. There is a great deal in what you say, said Mr. Whitechoker. Very true, said Mrs. Pedagog. But I wish he'd stop saying it. The last three dozen cakes have got cold as ice while he was talking, and I can't afford such reckless waste. Nor we, Mrs. Pedagog, said the idiot with a pleasant smile. For, as I was saying to the bibliomaniac this morning, your buckwheat cakes are, to my mind, the very highest development of our modern civilization, and to have even one of them wasted seems to me to be a crime against nature herself. For which a second, third, or fourth shaking up of this earth would be an inadequate punishment. This remark so pleased Mrs. Pedagog that she ordered the cook to send up a fresh lot of cakes, and the guests, after eating them, adjourned to their various duties with light hearts and digestions occupied with work of great importance. Chapter 11 I wonder what would have happened if Columbus had not discovered America," said the bibliomaniac as the company prepared to partake of the morning meal. He would have gone home disappointed, 
said the idiot, with a look of surprise on his face, which seemed to indicate that, in his opinion, the bibliomaniac was very dull-witted not to have solved the problem for himself. He would have gone home disappointed, and we would now be foreigners like most other Americans. Mr. Pedagog would doubtless be instructing the young scions of the aristocracy of Tipperary. Mr. Whitechoker would be Archbishop of Canterbury. The bibliomaniac would be raising bulbs in Holland, and— And you would be wandering about with the other wild men of Borneo at the present time, put in the schoolmaster. No, said the idiot, not quite. I should be dividing my time up between Holland, France, Switzerland, and Spain. You are an international sort of idiot, eh? queried the lawyer with a chuckle at his own wit. Say rather a cosmopolitan idiot, said the idiot. Among my ancestors I number individuals of various nations, though I suppose that if we go back far enough we were all in the same boat as far as that is concerned. One of my great-great-grandfathers was a Scotchman, one of them was a Dutchman, another was a Spaniard, and a fourth was a Frenchman. What the others were, I don't know. It's a nuisance looking up one's ancestors, I think. They increase, so as you go back into the past every man has had two grandfathers, four great-grandfathers, eight great-great-grandfathers, sixteen great-great-great-grandfathers, thirty-two fathers raised in the fourth power of great-grandness, and so on, increasing in number as you go further back until it is hardly possible for anyone to throw a brick into the pages of history without hitting somebody who is more or less responsible for his existence. I dare say there is a streak of Julius Caesar in me, and I haven't a doubt that if our friend Mr. Pedagog here were to take the trouble to investigate, he would find that Caesar and Cassius and Brutus could be numbered among his early progenitors. And now that I think of it, I must say that in my estimation he is an unusually amiable man, considering how diverse the nature of these men were. Think of it for a minute. Here a man unites in himself Caesar and Cassius and Brutus, two of whom killed the third, and then, having quarreled together, went out upon a battlefield and slaughtered themselves, after making extemporaneous remarks for which this miserable world gives Shakespeare all the credit. It's worse than the case of a friend of mine, one of whose grandfathers was French and the other German. How did it affect him? asked Mr. Whitechoker. It made him distrust himself, said the idiot with a smile, and for that reason he never could get on in the world. When his Teutonic nature suggested that he do something, his Gallic blood would rise up and spoil everything, and vice versa. He was eternally quarreling with himself. He was a victim to internal disorder of the worst sort. And what, pray, finally became of him? asked the clergyman. He shot himself in a duel, returned the idiot, with a wink at the genial old gentleman who occasionally imbibed. It was very sad. I've known sadder things, said Mr. Pedagog wearily. Your elaborate jokes, for instance, they are enough to make a strong man weep. You flatter me, Mr. Pedagog, said the idiot. I have never in all my experience as a cracker of jests made a man laugh until he cried, but— I hope to some day. But really, do you know I think Columbus is an immensely overrated man? If you come down to it, what did he do? He went out to sea in a ship and sailed for three months, and when he least expected it ran slam-bang up against the western hemisphere. It was like shooting at a barn door with a gatling gun. He was bound to hit it sooner or later. You don't give him any credit for tenacity or purpose or good judgment, then?" asked Mr. Brief. Uh, of course I do. Plenty of it. He stuck to his ship like a hero who didn't know how to swim. His judgment was great. He had too much sense to go back to Spain without any news of something, because he fully understood that unless he had something to show for the trip there would have been a great laugh on Queen Isabella for selling her jewels to provide for a ninety-day yacht cruise for him and a lot of common sailors, which would never have done. So he kept on and on, and finally some unknown lookout up in the bow discovered America. 
Then Columbus went home and told everybody that if it hadn't been for his own eagle eye, emigration wouldn't have been invented, and world's fairs would have been local institutions. Then they got up a parade in which the king and queen graciously took part, and Columbus became a great man. Meanwhile, the unknown lookout who did discover the land was knocking about the town and thinking he was a very lucky fellow to get an extra glass of grog. It wasn't anything more than the absolute justice of fate that caused the new land to be named America and not Columbia. It really ought to have been named after that fellow up in the bow. But, my dear idiot, put in the bibliomaniac, the scheme itself was Columbus's own. He evolved the theory that the earth is round like a ball. To quote Mr. Pedagog, began the idiot. You can't quote me in your own favor, snapped the schoolmaster. Wait until I have finished, said the idiot. I was only going to quote you by saying tut, that's all. And so I repeat in the words of Mr. Pedagog, tut, tut, evolved the theory. Why, man, how could he help evolving the theory? There was the sun rising in the east every morning and setting in the west every night. What else was there to believe? That somebody put the sun out every night and sneaked back east with it under cover of darkness? But you forget that the wise men of the day laughed at his idea, said Mr. Pedagog, surveying the idiot after the fashion of a man who has dealt an adversary a stinging blow. That only proves what I have always said, replied the idiot. Wise men can't find fun in anything but stern facts. Wise men always do laugh at truth. Whenever I advance some new proposition, you sit up there next to Mrs. Pedagog and indulge in tut-tutterance of the most intolerant sort. If you had been one of the wise men of Columbus's time, there isn't any doubt in my mind that when Columbus said the earth was round, you'd have remarked, Tut, tut, in Spanish. There was silence for a minute, and the idiot began again. There's another point about this whole business that makes me tired, he said. It only goes to prove the conceit of these Europeans. Here was a great continent inhabited by countless people. A European comes over here and is said to be the discoverer of America, and is glorified. Statues of him are scattered broadcast all over the world. Pictures of him are printed in the newspapers and magazines. A dozen different varieties of portraits of him are printed on postage stamps as big as circus posters. And all for what? Because he discovered a land that millions of Indians had known about for centuries. On the other hand, when Columbus goes back to Spain, several of the Native Americans trust their precious lives to his old tubs. One of these savages must have been the first American to discover Europe. Where are the statues of the Indian who discovered Europe? Where are the postage stamps showing how he looked on the day when Europe first struck his vision? Where is anybody spending a billion of dollars getting up a World's Fair in commemoration of Lowe's discovery of Europe? He didn't know it was Europe, said the bibliomaniac. Columbus didn't know this was America, retorted the idiot. In fact, Columbus didn't know anything. He didn't know any better than to write a letter to Queen Isabella and mail it in a keg that never turned up. He didn't even know how to steer his old boat into a real solid continent instead of getting ten days on the island. He was an awfully wise man. He saw an island swarming with Indians and said, Why, this must be India. And worst of all, if his pictures mean anything, he didn't even know enough to choose his face and stick to it. Don't talk, Columbus, to me unless you want to prove that luck is the greatest factor of success. Ill luck is sometimes a factor of success, said Mr. Pedagog. You are a successful idiot, which appears to me to be extremely unfortunate. I don't know about that, said the idiot. I adapt myself to my company, and, of course, then you are a schoolmaster among schoolmasters, a lawyer among lawyers, and so forth queried the bibliomaniac. What are you when your company is made up of widely diverse characters? asked Mr. Brief before the idiot had a chance to reply to the bibliomaniac's question. I'd try to be a widely diverse character myself. And trying to sit on many stools fall and become 
just an idiot, said Mr. Pedagog. That's according to the way you look at it. I put my company to the test in the crucible of my mind. I analyze the characters of all about me. And whatever quality predominates in the precipitate, that I become. Thus, in the presence of my employer and his office boy, I become a mixture of both. Something of the employer, something of an office boy. I run errands for my employer and boss the office boy. With you gentlemen, I go through the same process. The bibliomaniac, the schoolmaster, Mr. Brief, and the rest of you have been cast into the crucible, and I have tried to approximate the result. And are an idiot, said the schoolmaster. It is your own name for me, gentlemen, returned the idiot. I presume you have recognized your composite self and have chosen the title accordingly. You were a little hard on me this morning, weren't you? asked the genial old gentleman who occasionally imbibed that evening when he and the idiot were discussing the morning's chat. I didn't like to say anything about it, but I don't think you ought to have thrown me into the crucible with the rest. I wish you had spoken, said the idiot warmly. It would have given me a chance to say that the grain of sense that once or twice a year leavens the lump of my idiocy is directly due to the ingredient furnished by yourself. Here's to you, old man. If you and I lived alone together, what a wise man I should be. And then the genial old gentleman went to the cupboard and got out a bottle of port wine that he had been preserving in cobwebs for ten years. This he opened, and as he did so, he said, I've been keeping this for years, my boy. It was dedicated in my youth to the thirst of the first man who truly appreciated me. Take it all. I'll divide it with you, returned the idiot with a smile. For really, old fellow, I think you, uh, I think you appreciate yourself as much as I do. Chapter 12 I wonder what it costs to run a flat," said the idiot, stirring his coffee with the salt spoon, a proceeding which seemed to indicate that he was thinking of something else. "'Don't you keep an expense account?' asked the bibliomaniac slyly. <laughs> <laughs> laughed Mrs. Pedagog. First-rate joke,' said the idiot with a smile. "'But really, now, I should like to know for how little an apartment could be run. I am interested.' Mrs. Pedagog stopped laughing at once. The idiot's words were ominous. She did not like his views, but she did like his money, and she was not at all anxious to lose him as a boarder. "'It's very expensive,' she said firmly. "'I shouldn't ever advise anyone to undertake living in a flat. Rents are high. Butcher bills are enormous, because the butchers have to pay commissions, not only to the cook, so that she'll use twice as much lard as she can, and give away three or four times as much to the poor as she ought, but janitors have to be seen to, and elevator boys, and all that. Groceries come high for the same reason. Oh, no, flat life isn't the life for anybody. I say, give me a good first-class boarding-house. Am I not right, John?" "'Yes, indeed,' said Mr. Pedagog. Every time. I lived in a flat once, and it was an awful nuisance. Above me lived a dancing-master who gave lessons at every hour of the day in the room directly over my study, so that I was always being disturbed at my work, while below me was a music-teacher who was practicing all night so that I could hardly sleep. Worst of all, on the same floor with me was a miserable person of convivial tendencies who always mistook my door for his when he came home after midnight, and who gave some quite estimable people two floors below to believe that it was I and not he who sang comic songs between three and four o'clock in the morning. There has not been too much love lost between the idiot and myself, but I cannot be so vindictive as to recommend him to live in a flat. I can bear testimony to the same effect," put in Mr. Brief, who was two weeks in arrears and anxious to conciliate his landlady. Testimony to the effect that Mr. Pedagog sang comic songs in the early morning," said the idiot. Nonsense! I don't believe it. I have lived in this house for two years with Mr. Pedagog, and I've never heard him raise his voice in song yet. I, I didn't mean anything of the sort," retorted Mr. Brief. You know I didn't. Don't apologize to me," said the idiot, 
apologized Mr. Pedagog. He is the man you have wronged. What did he say? put in Mr. Pedagog, with a stern look at Mr. Brief. I didn't hear what he said. I, I didn't say anything, said the lawyer, e except that I could bear testimony to the effect that your existence with flat life was similar to mine. This young person, with his customary nerve, tries to make it appear that I said you sang comic songs in the early morning. I try to do nothing of the sort, said the idiot. I simply expressed my belief that in spite of what you said, Mr. Pedagog was innocent, and I do so because my experience with him has taught me that he is not the kind of man who would do that sort of thing. He has neither time, voice, nor inclination. He has an ear, two of them, in fact, and an impressionable mind, but— Oh, tut! interrupted the schoolmaster. When I need a defender, you may spare yourself the trouble of flying to my rescue. I know I may, said the idiot, but with me it's a question of can and can't. I'm willing to attack you personally, but while I live, no other shall do so. Wherefore I tell Mr. Brief plainly, and to his face, that if he says you ever sang a comic song, he says what is not so. You might hum one, but sing it? Never. We were talking of flats, I believe, said Mr. Whitechoker. Yes, said the idiot, and these persons have changed it from flat talk to sharp talk. Well, anyhow, put in Mr. Brief, I lived in a flat once, and it was anything but pleasant. I lost a case once for the simple and only reason that I lived in a flat. It was a case that required a great deal of strategy on my part and I invited my client to my home to unfold my plan of action. I got interested in the scheme as I unfolded it, and spoke in my usual impassioned manner as though addressing a jury, and would you believe it, the opposing counsel happened to be visiting a friend on the next floor, and my eloquence floated up through the air shaft and gave our whole plan of action away. We were routed on the point we had supposed would pierce the enemy's armor and lay him at our feet, for the whole simple reason that the abominable air shaft had made my strategic move a matter of public knowledge. That's a good idea for a play, said the idiot. A roaring farce could be built up on that basis. Villain and accomplice on one floor, innocent victim on floor above. Plot floats up air shaft, innocent victim overhears. Villain and accomplice say, ha ha, for three acts, and take a back seat in the fourth with a grand transformation showing the conspirators in the county jail as a finale. Write it up with lots of livestock wandering in and out. Bring in janitors and elevator boys and butchers. Show up some of the humors of flat life, if there be any such. Call it a hole in the flat. And put it on the stage. Nine hundred nights is the very shortest run it could have, which at fifty dollars a night for the author is forty-five thousand dollars in good hard dollars. Mr. Poet, the idea is yours for a fiver. Say the word. Thanks, said the poet with a smile. I'm not a dramatist. Then I'll have to do it myself, said the idiot. And if I do, good-bye, Shakespeare. That's so, said Mr. Pedagog. Nothing could more effectually ruin the dramatic art than to have you write a play. People seeing your work would say, Here, this will never do. The stage must be discouraged at all costs. A hypocrite throws the ministry into disgrace, an ignoramus brings shame upon education, and an unpopular lawyer gives the bar a bad name. I think you are just the man to ruin Shakespeare. Then I'll give up my ambition to become a playwright and stick to idiocy, said the idiot. But to come back to flats. Your feeling in regard to them is entirely different from that of a friend of mine who has lived in one for ten years. He thinks flat life is ideal. His children can't fall down stairs, because there aren't any stairs to fall down. His roof never leaks, because he hasn't any roof to leak. And when he and his family want to go off somewhere, all he has to do is lock his front door and go. Burglars never climb into his front window, because they are all eight flights up. Damp cellars don't trouble him, because they are too far down to do him any injury, even if they overflow. 
The cares of housekeeping are reduced to a minimum. His cook doesn't spend all her time in the front area flirting with the postman because there isn't any front area to his flat, and in a social way his wife is most delightfully situated because most of her friends live in the same building, and instead of having to hire a carriage to go calling in, all she has to do is to take the elevator and go from one floor to another. If he pines for a change of scene, he is high enough up in the air to get it by looking out of his windows, over the tops of other buildings, into the green fields to the north, or looking westward into the state of New Jersey. Instead of taking a drive through the park or a walk, all he and his wife need to do is to take a telescope and follow some little sylvan path with their eyes. Then, as for expense, he finds that he saves money by means of a cooperative scheme. For instance, if he wants shad for dinner, and he and his wife cannot eat a whole one, he goes shares on the shad and its cost with his neighbors above and below. Yes, and his neighbors above and below borrow tea and eggs and butter and ice and other things whenever they run short, so that in that way he loses all he saves," said Mr. Pedagog, resolved not to give in. He does if he isn't smart said the idiot. I thought of that myself and asked him about it, and he told me that he kept account of all that, and always made it a point after some neighbor had borrowed two pounds of butter from him to send in before the week was over and borrow three pounds of butter from the neighbor. So far his books show that he is sixteen pounds of butter, seven pounds of tea, and one bottle of vanilla extract, and a ton of ice ahead of the whole house. He is six eggs and a box of matches behind in his egg and match count, but under the circumstances I think he can afford it. But, said Mrs. Pedagog, anxious to know the worst, why, er, why are you so interested? Well, said the idiot slowly, I, uh, I am contemplating a change, Mrs. Pedagog, a change that would fill me. I say it sincerely, too, with regret if the idiot paused a minute and his eye swept fondly about the table. His voice was getting a little husky, too, Mr. Whitechoker noticed. It would fill me with regret, I say, if it were not that in taking up housekeeping I am, I am to have the assistance of a better half. What? cried the bibliomaniac. You? You are going to be, to be married? Why not? said the idiot. Imitation is the sincerest flattery. Mr. Pedagog marries, and I am going to flatter him as sincerely as I can by following in his footsteps. May I, may we ask to whom? asked Mrs. Pedagog softly. Certainly, said the idiot, to Mr. Barlow's daughter. Mr. Barlow is, or was, my employer. Was? Is he not now? Are you going out of business?" asked Mr. Pedagog. No, but you see, when I went to see Mr. Barlow in the matter, he told me that he liked me very much, and he had no doubt I would make a good husband for his daughter, but after all, he added, that I was nothing but a confidential clerk on a small salary, and he thought his daughter could do better. She couldn't find a better fellow, Mr. Idiot said Mr. Pedagog, and Mr. Pedagog rose to the occasion by nodding his entire acquiescence in the statement. Thank you very much, said the idiot. That was precisely what I told Mr. Barlow, and I suggested a scheme to him by which his sole objection could be got around. You would start in business for yourself, said Mr. Whitechoker. In a sense, yes, said the idiot. Only the way I put it was that a good confidential clerk would make a good partner for him, and he, after thinking it over, thought I was right. It certainly was a characteristically novel way out of the dilemma, said Mr. Brief with a smile. I thought so myself, and so did he, so it was all arranged. On the first of next month I enter the firm, and on the fifteenth I am, uh, to be married. The company warmly congratulated the idiot upon his good fortune, and he shortly left the room more overcome by their felicitations than he had been by their arguments in the past. The few days left passed quickly by, and there came a breakfast at Mrs. Pedagog's house that was a mixture of joy and sadness. Joy for his happiness, sadness that the table should know the idiot no more.
Among the wedding gifts was a handsomely bound series of volumes, including a cyclopedia, a dictionary, and a little tome of poems, the first output of the poet. These came together with a card inscribed, From Your Friends of the Breakfast Table, of whom the idiot said, when Mrs. Idiot asked for information, They, my dear, next to yourself and my parents, are the dearest friends I ever had. We must have them up to breakfast some morning." Breakfast? queried Mrs. Idiot. Yes, my dear, he replied simply. I should be afraid to meet them at any other meal. I am always at my best at breakfast, and they, well, they never are. End of Part 3 of The Idiot End of The Idiot by John Kendrick Bangs